My name is Matthew, and I will be your conference operator today. I would like to welcome everyone to the pros and cons of CAPD versus CCPD conference call. All have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to draw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. Now let know you may begin your conference. Hello, thank you for joining us for the latest session of the DaVita PD webinar series. This series covers the key clinical elements of managing patients on PD and is recommended for all DaVita nurses, medical directors, as well as any physician who has or plans to put patients on PD. Our series takes place on the first Friday of every month at 11 a.m. Pacific Time and 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Today's audience is a mix of physicians and DaVita teammates. We have about 175 individuals that will be on today's call. And I'd like to see that so many people have such interest around the therapy of home modalities and specifically PD. As a reminder, all of our webinar sessions are recorded and are available for on-demand access on kidneysupport.webex.com. Here, these webinars refer to frequently throughout our presentation, so please take some time to watch them if your time allows. If you have questions, please save them for the 30-minute Q&A session at the end of today's presentation, or you can type them in the discussion section of your WebEx box. Today is the pros and cons of CAPD versus CCPD, and I'll pass on to John Moran, who will introduce today's speaker. John? Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. It's a special pleasure for me to introduce Dr. T I'm afraid it's going to be a long introduction because this is a physician who brings a wealth of experience to the therapy. Dr. Chris held numerous leadership positions throughout his career while in private practice, including president of the Glynn County Medical Society and medical director of Metabolic Unit, a dialysis, chairman of the Institutional Review Board, and chair of medicine for Southeast Georgia Regional Medical Center. Recently, Dr. Tucker. I served as president and CEO of Coastal Nephrology Associates in Brunswick, Georgia, medical director for several outpatient dialysis facilities. He was chief medical officer with Gambro Health for the Southeast Division prior to the David acquisition in 2005, and since then has been on the Davida Physician Council. He is also the group medical director for the Trailblazers Group at Davida. Dr. Tucker graduated from and completed his nephrology fellowship at the Medical University of South Carolina, where he also served as Assistant Professor of Medicine and Chief of Nephrology at the VA Medical Center. Dr. Tucker, take it away. Uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. Today, we're to talk about peritoneal dialysis, the evolution of treatment and options, CPD and CCPD, pro and con. Before going any further, I must state that the content and opinions of this presentation are those of the speaker and do not necessarily express the views of DeVita. Today, what I'd like to do is talk about peritoneal dialysis, first starting in the very early days in the 60-70 period with amendment peritoneal dialysis, and then with you, evolve the treatment options into CAPD and CCPD. Hopefully, then you'll get a better perspective of how these modalities developed, the complication and related issues that we were facing at the time, the requirements for peritoneal dialysis to be acceptable, and then where we are today, the pros and cons. About dialysis in the early days, the limitation clearly was access. Uh, access for peritoneal dialysis was uh, crucial, and because of that, uh, provided only in-hospital uh, peritoneal support. The way the access in was a mid approach. Local anesthesia, as shown here with this wonderful glass syringe, testifies that this is an old slide. After the anesthesia, we make a local incision and with that, we use an angiocath device, which was uh, used for IV placement uh, in those days, but long enough to penetrate the peritoneal cavity. 
Uh, this uh, device then allowed us to infuse liters of preheated dialysate into the uh, intra-abdominal area, the purpose of which was to help protect from inadvertently uh, perforating the bowel when the catheter was placed. This old catheter that we used, and inside the catheter here is a trocar. The trocar had a um, a sharp point at the end, which allowed us to penetrate the peritoneal cavity. What we're seeing is that this catheter then is being tilted and toward the left lower quadrant. As the catheter is advanced off the trocar, then it is placed facing into the left lower quadrant to hopefully ensure better drainage. When we were through, and one can see this is a very simplistic uh, setup, and really nothing to retard it from being pushed into the abdomen. A lot of uh, interesting devices to prevent this from happening, but we'll save that for another time. But this is a system that was in place, so how did we do what we did, and how did we determine what to do? Well, first, we go to this slide, which is peritoneal urea clearance. This is in mils per minute, and this is uh, the dialyzed volume of fluid at one liter per hour, two liters per hour, three liters, and so forth. One can see that there is a continuous increase in urea clearance uh, with increasing volume per hour, and it does tend then to flatten off as you get higher and higher volume. If you look at two liters in particular, we see that on the curve that the urea clearance is pretty much capturing the majority of the curve. So actually two liter infusions were chosen to do intermittent PD because the other reason was this. Two intermittent PD in the 60s and 70s was quite a labor intensive process. We see hanging are two one liter bottles. These bottles that were preheated in a water bath. Now if you use a water bath in a hospital then we that all kind of interesting things can grow in that. And so the fact that we had uh, some problem with infection is certainly uh, understood. What would happen is the nurse would come in, take this fluid, and then instill it into the patient, clamp up the line, let that fluid stay there for 30 to 40 minutes, and then drain out the fluid in the um, bottles. So they had to come back to do that then run more fluid in to repeat the process. This was done every hour, and the procedure, uh, as it was done, could go anywhere from 24 to 36 hours or until biochemical control had been reached and fluid goals had been reached. Now, this is done for both acute and chronic patients. For acute patients, you might leave that catheter in place and try to come back and repeat the process but sooner or later, this catheter had to be removed. If PD was still required, it had to be reinserted. So a real, real problem. Um, this was all done within the hospital. There was no way to do this procedure at home. And even though chronic patients were covered this way until they could go on hemodialysis, what they did was usually went home, come back, and have this catheter reinserted and the process redone. So that is intermittent dialysis as it was first practiced. Nothing changed, however, with the Tinkoff catheter. So here is a single cuff Tinkoff catheter and a double cuff Tinkoff catheter. And once this was introduced, it changed uh, what we did. This catheter could be placed just like what I suggested earlier, through midline approach. The difference is the catheter could fit inside the trocar. The trocar then punches into the uh, intra-abdominal cavity, and everything else being done exactly like what I said by putting fluid in earlier. The trocar then disassemble with the catheter left in place. And the other difference is that the uh, catheter was then tunneled underneath the skin to have an exit site that would be remote from where we did the midline incision. This cutter could be left in place for an indefinite period of time. Therefore, it could be used either for acute kidney failure or it could be used for chronic kidney failure patients because of 
uh, the properties of the catheter. For acute patients, once they recover, the catheter could be easily removed just by pulling on it. Uh, chronic patients, we would just put in place and definitely uh, continue their treatment. Well, that big uh, advance, we can come back and look at our curve again and say, well, now we have uh, a device that we can leave in place, so that's not going to be a limiting factor. So what about area removal and, and um, solute removal? If we go back and we look at this curve, uh, we increase volume, we're going to get better clearance. And all we need is some sort of device to allow us to do that, and it looks like we're going to have an even better option. Well, exactly what took place, the device that you're looking at is not a hemodialysis machine, but actually a reverse osmosis retinyl dialysis machine. So here is a uh, two-liter bottle of concentrate. This, mixed with the RO water, could provide 40 liters of dialysate. So what happened is patients with dialyze, four liters, 10 hours a session, up four to five sessions a week, providing 40 to 50 hours of dialysis, and that became the new intermittent dialysis um, reverse osmosis technique. Patients could be done within the hospital acutely using this device, or we could train patients to go home and use this device, and that's exactly what we did. So whether in the hospital or whether in the home, this device became quite acceptable, and the home patient population began to grow. Now, there are uh, certainly some limitations, as we find out. The first one is the fact that we had a rather divide of opinion and whether or not pale dialysis was even an acceptable therapy. We had uh, a real dominance of hemodialysis thought and direction. So inevitably, to answer this question, it had to be done comparing this technique versus hemodialysis. An opportunity and privilege of participating in such a, a study it was the VA cooperative study on um, uh, versus peritoneal. And very uh, quickly, um, the results were somewhat disappointing in the fact that patients undergoing peritoneal dialysis around 8 to 12 month mark often showed signs and symptoms of uremia. Uh, think that they would have um, weight loss, appetite, to even encephalopathic features, asterixis, and so forth. So this is really, really disappointing, but fortuitously happening at the same time that this study was being reported and closed was this, a simpler approach. Dolph and Dr. Moncrief were reporting on an entirely different approach to, to dialysis. Their approach involved utilization not of large volumes of fluid per hour, but the converse. Two loops that allowed to stay within the intra-abdominal cavity until the peritoneal fluid and blood became in equilibrium, at which time that fluid would be drained and new fluid applied. They're suggesting four exchanges for their patients at the time and noted that they were doing well. Well, now we see the birth of what now is called continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. And what that meant back then in the uh, early 80 period was that patients would take fluid much like you would run an IV in, except we take dialysis fluid into the intra-abdominal area, we clamp the line off, we roll the bag and the tubing up, the patient then either puts it in his pocket and the pants under the dress, or even a fishnet that they could wear to use it as a carrier for this material. They would carry this around until it was time to drain out, at which time they would take the bag out, unlock the clamp, let the fluid drain out, and then repeat the process. So it was quite labor-intensive for that, but a quite effective treatment. Now, for those of us that were not opposed to machines, we had at our disposal a very simpler peritoneal device, not like the RO machine. It consisted of some prongs that you could hang dialysate fluid, a heater compartment that would warm the fluid, a that would allow us to set the delivery and also 
a volume control that would allow us to determine the volume that went into the patient. So with a cycler, we thought that, boy, wouldn't it be nice to take this and do it at nighttime using longer dwells and then uh, perhaps leaving fluid in for an all-day dwell. And this was the beginning of what um, we called automated long cycle peritoneal dialysis, but subsequently is known as CCPD or HPD. So that's how these treatments were evolving. One failure became great success. Where we end up in the um, early 80 period is that intermittent peritoneal dialysis with this long laborious process really had um, now uh, been surpassed. Uh, first osmosis peritoneal dialysis was really not in use. And the melodies of choice were continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis two exchanges usually, four exchanges per 24 hours, or using a simpler cycler device at two to three liters um, volume and three to four exchanges during the night with a dwell during the day. So that's how we started this. So what was the practice that we were going through in the um, early 80 to 84 period? Basically, peritoneal dialysis could be used for acute kidney failure and chronic kidney failure. For a kidney failure, the Tinkoff catheter was placed. We would dialyze them. Um, when they had recovered, we would just simply uh, remove the catheter. For chronic renal failure, we would then started on dialysis, and when they were able, uh, we would pick up right on the training and convert them into a home therapy option or at least be able to maintain them until a suitable uh, access for hemodialysis was available and then convert them to hemo. Hospital setting, we could use um, CAPD if they were going through a lot of procedures, or we just put them on uh, overnight dialysis with the cycler. The intensive care unit we did there was uh, often a combination of hybrid therapy. We could use intermittent peritoneal dialysis to bring people's volume or biochemistry quickly in line, and if they're going to be there for a while, then we could use a longer dwell approach to provide more continuous uh, biochemical control, just like one might do with CV, uh, CVVH. So this was a very, very flexible tool that we had. In our own program, which grew up into the 40 to 50 range in very short order, we know that all patients were very easy to train. We could actually design peritoneal regimens um, and we trained them all on uh, both CAPD and the cycler. Uh, but we had to make it where they were picking and choosing based upon their need, and that's kind of how they chose. Now, uh, maybe a little bit of bias on the CCPD, and most patients seem to be uh, choosing that, and it could be that that's what that was at the time. I uh, would that uh, in that era, in the 70 and 80 era, patients who presented uh, were using uh, uremic and had uh, very, very low uh, residual renal function at the time they started dialysis. Well, uh, quickly I want to run through some problems that we saw because this has come up in some of the meetings that we've had. Um, so I want to highlight this just quickly. Uh, in terms of leak syndrome, we had two types, early and late. How, how convenient. Uh, early meant that as soon as we put the catheter in in that midline approach and started them on PD, even using low volumes, we could see seepage of fluid either from the exit site or from the insertion site. Uh, fluid could accumulate intra-abdominally, and this is not what you want to see happen, uh, particularly with uh, knowledge that, that we have a glucose amino acid uh, solution now bathing uh, areas that we or not wishing to see infection get started. This is a question about our catheter, catheter insertion technique, and whether or not, uh, end of the day, that we would end up having to change this. Uh, it didn't happen all the time, but it happened enough to be uh, very uh, much of a concern. Leg syndrome usually occurred in those that were already established on dialysis, and usually those using the um, cycler. In these cases, the lake uh, was more of the function of poor technique at home, and fluid would run in, or and there would be an alarm, 
and other than draining out fluid, they'd take on another um, load of fluid, and they would keep that up until they became clearly volume excess. Volume excess with overload of the peritoneal cavity then leading to leaking uh, into the intra-abdominal areas, and certainly this is a, was a concern because you would have to discontinue sometimes the therapy to allow that to resolve, and sometimes that stuff would also get infected. The issue that we were dealing with then is how much dialysis was to provide. Uh, we had already gone through one cycle where we had seen people undergoing peritoneal dialysis become uh, uremic, and so we were monitoring our patients very carefully in terms of their weight, in terms of their clinical status, and we provided what we thought was reasonable dialysis, which in retrospect certainly could have been maybe too much dialysis. The problem too much dialysis with uh, peritoneal is the fact that we're using glucose solutions, and so more than you need will lead to metabolic issues in terms of excessive weight gain. Uh, aggravation of diabetic control and potentially aggravating dyslipidemia. So we did have some problems to overcome there. The two big areas, though, were infection and hernia formation that led to some concerns. I would point out that infection, uh, when you talk about infection now versus then, uh, you know, you're going from a one point, uh, one every six months uh, up to 84 range. We were at one and 24 months. But with that large number of patients, you were guaranteed to see infection issues and problems. Now, this slide I present to show you what you know. There was a problem in the past that told us not to do things, and this is certainly one of them. I just slide up to say, how many problems do you see? I will point out that the bottom of the pajamas are not buttoned, as somebody pointed out. So get that out of the way. We're seeing here is not a condom, although back in this era, this is where HIV was making an emergence. Uh, but this is actually a finger cot. And the thought was, boy, all we need to do is put bed down and soak the end of this catheter, and we'll have a self-sterilizing mechanism. Well, uh, it didn't take long before reports came out suggesting uh, the isolation of pseudomonas and beta dyne. So this quickly uh, was uh, altered and changed. This cup on the um, Tinkoff catheter is, uh, no, I'm sure, uh, listed by all as, my goodness, what were you people thinking? Uh, this is an alligator clamp. This is metal. This is not. So what happens is this catheter gets placed in this position. The clamp is actually putting micro perforations in the catheter or even lacerating the catheter. The result, we got use splicing and dicing catheters in order to keep from having to replace catheters, but all the time was that successful. This is a tremendous tragedy when something of uh, this nature takes away a catheter and then gives you another problem to deal with. Uh, we see what appears to be an exit busting and uh, maybe some surrounding areas that look infected, but if you follow this, there's swelling in the area. And so out in the periphery, we see this area. So this swelling is actually a tunnel infection. And the area over here is a sinus tract. So this is an actual abscess that has developed in this particular patient. So infections and problems, sometimes we created our own misery. I just wanted to acknowledge that right away. Now, Dr. Bergman last month gave a presentation on complications of peritoneal dialysis. It is not my intent nor my desire to, to revisit that. However, since we did uh, deal with these problems, it did lead, uh, lead us to make some decisions about how to evaluate this that I'm hoping will supplement her presentation. What we see in this catheter is a fibrin strand, really, but not always. This certainly could indicate infection. Because we saw so much infection, issues and problems and had so many issues and concerns intra-abdominally, we adopted peritoneal endoscopy back in 1979 and 80 to investigate uh, these problems. This is what we fear the most. This is uh, bacterial peritonitis uh, in a patient undergoing analysis. The features are the white background 
brown, very, very white. Uh, and this is fibrin deposition. These are fibrous strands that have developed between the intra-abdominal wall and bowel loop, which is seen here, and additionally, between bowel loops. This is what um, we would fear the most. This patient is um, going to lose the ability to do peritoneal dialysis. But when this further goes uh, to the point of fibrinous bands, this patient will have uh, the intense risk for bowel obstruction in the future. Uh, this is certainly something that you should uh, look at and uh, put in your mind that this is why we educate patients, this is why we educate the staff, and this is why at the first sign of infection it must be treated appropriately. In grass, this is the normal appearance of the peritoneal cavity. You see actually even blood vessels running up and down, nice red appearance. So that is your, your difference in appearance. Dr. in her presentation noted blood in the uh, catheter and listed a number of factors. Uh, I just wanted to add one more to that. The blood in this case um, occurred about a week or two after an episode of infection. And what we're seeing here is actually a perineoscopy view looking at the abdomen at the surface of the bowel. And see all of this hemorrhagic area here, which you can't see are little strands of fibrin that have been on the bowel that are pulling away causing this hemorrhage. So sometimes in the resolution of perineal uh, infection, these little fibrinous strands can cause some irritation, give rise to this blood on the surface, and then therefore put blood in the uh, peritoneal fluid. Something to know about. Again, this is an interesting x-ray, and I present this for a couple of reasons. Number one, again, you have to go back in the time when everything was a question and we had very few answers. Uh, this patient actually had some problems with catheter drainage, and we decided to do a catheter uh, study. Now, I would say that catheter studies uh, pretty much are worthless unless someone who has high interest in the results of that study is watching. What we did is use a small all amount of contrast infusion through the catheter and monitored how the uh, contrast went through the catheter under fluoroscopy. So we actually tracked it all the way down the catheter because we had not only an interest whether it had diffusion throughout the perineal cavity, we wanted to know how the contrast actually exited the catheter. And so as we did that study, we were convinced and using the uh, fluoro table what we would do is change positions to see if the catheter was movable as it should be. And what we did is get them to get on all fours with that contrast still in the abdomen. For a couple of minutes, we would then get them to lie down. And we would put the that we use for peritoneoscopy in the perineal cavity. And then by using this marker over the umbilicus, we would take actually a cross table lateral view. Of that. And this mission is interesting because it, it demonstrated what we wondered. Actual contrast that is now up in the intra-abdominal area, out of the peritoneal cavity, around the catheter, and actually pooling up here. Uh, and remember that time you can tug on the catheter, you can actually create a space. But what we wondered is, if you had an infection in this area, could fluid actually track down into the peritoneal cavity, or had infection here, could it actually track upward? And the answer to both seeing, well, is plausible because certainly this occurred. Again, raising questions, what do we do about the catheter to make this less likely to happen? Do we need to change our approach? The other thing that you see, is this is an area of deep and you actually air here. There's uh, 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 communication is open. So this is actually a defect in the abdominal wall. And if you could see real close, there's a little air that goes up this way toward the quarter, which is sitting over the umbilicus. What this is is an early um, umbilical hernia and get ready to develop. And what this told us is this patient hadn't been undergoing 
peritoneal dialysis with a lot of uh, intra-abdominal pressure enough to create this. This actually was a defect in the abdominal wall, and our intra-abdominal pressure is going to make this connect itself into an umbilical hernia. So, no ways did intra-abdominal pressure cause hernias itself. It accentuates existing defects. That certainly made us stop and think a little bit. Diamond in her presentation noted that there was really no good way, CT or otherwise, to look at uh, the intra-abdominal area and look at adhesions. Since we were put catheters in and out, we did the same cross-table lateral approach with a catheter study and air contrast. And this is the way we demonstrated adhesions coming down. Here you see a lot of adhesions around the catheter. And in this case, uh, we were having drainage trouble. The question is, could we just do our approach and put the catheter in through the midline? Answer, no, they are adhesions. They're at a high risk of bowel perforation. And, and so this patient, if we were going to continue PD, would need peritoneoscopy look to see if any of this could be freed up. But by large, this patient looks like probably lost uh, peritoneal dialysis. Well, Groups of hernias and um, CAPD um, occurred and the sites and so forth occurred. I did allude to the fact that some of this um, was felt to be intra-abdominal pressure related, but we also could add that there's some developmental aspects to these hernias. Well, putting all this together, we had a lot of concerns that you can might um, imagine in action. We looked at how we were doing CAPD versus the cycler. We had many more connects, disconnects with CAPD. We thought infection might should be greater. We thought hernia formation should be greater, although, yes, it could be selection for intra-abdominal defects, too, and uh, how you account for that. But we thought so they walked around with the flu all the time. That intra-abdominal pressure would be higher, and they should be at more risk patient selection and satisfaction. We thought people might be more satisfied doing it at night when they can sleep versus dealing with it during the day. But the adding question is, could either one of these modalities, and could PD actually ever come to compare to the success of hemodialysis in terms of survival and outcome? We're still dogged by the notion of what is adequate peritoneal dialysis. Going forward, several things had to happen. One, we had to address catheter and catheter placement. We had to develop some technology to assist us. We had to start better defining our regimen and the requirements. And above all, we had to start acquiring data and uh, mass quantity to understand what to do and how to do it. Well, as far as catheter placement, catheter type, I'm going to refer you to the Crabtree webinar on the version of catheters. It's so excellent, uh, but we'll uh, certainly answer the question that the midline area, the simple thing that we used to do, is no longer done. You have to have better support, and he underlines all of that in the webinar, and I highly recommend that to you. Back in the day, uh, every patient we started on peritoneal dialysis, we did um, basically not only an ultrafiltration profile, but being skeptical of everything and wanting to see numbers, we actually did uh, profiles of ultrafiltration and clearance at 1.5 and 2.5% and 4.25%. And once we had that, one of the things we recognized that each patient seemed to maintain their own profile unless something happen. If they had infection, they lose that profile. We studied them with peritoneoscopy. Some, but not all, had evidence of um, adhesions and loss of peritoneal surface area, but it certainly raised the question why the others had changed when we couldn't see any visible evidence. So in this uh, late early 90 period, there was a great interest on, on peritoneal membrane and mechanics how it functioned and how things worked, and only evolved into what's now known as the peritoneal equilibrium test. This presented showed that basically not all patients are the same, that there are different transport mechanisms involved in some patient groups. 
specifically, if we look at rapid transport of glucose, we see a rapid fall off over the course of time. And when you lose glucose rapidly, it affects ultrafiltration. So you have lower ultrafiltration at any percentage concentration of glucose. You're just losing the gradient for ultrafiltration. Similarly, if you're low transporter and you're not getting the glucose out, then you're maintaining that ultrafiltration ability longer and you end up with a higher volume as a result. For a molecular weight substance, a rapid uh, of um, a rapid solute uh, removal versus a slower removal um, down here for our rapid group. So basically, then, when we're looking at the um, low transporter, uh, see this type curve and the uh, rapid transporter for uh, this case, it was creatinine, this type curve. So what did all this really mean? Uh, for rapid transporters with well, rapid uh, solute, uh, rapid loss of ultrafiltration, maybe shorter dwell, such as could be done with the cycler, would be recommended. And then for slow transporters um, and the uh, change in solute and change in ultrafiltration would be more favorable for a longer dwell or a CAPD type regimen. And in between, you could do either or. So I suggested that. But a lot of work went into membrane and membrane transport for the next decade. Finally, we come to looking at adequacy of dialysis and nutrition outcome. This is a study that um, uh, we'll reference first. This is the CANUSA study. And I'll just go right to the punchline. And the conclusion of this study um, here, that AT over uh, D for urea was targeted. And they felt that a patient studied in order to keep them uh, to a, uh, an expected survival rate at two years at 78% at a KT over V of urea at 2.1 and a creatinine clearance of 70 meters per 1.73 meters square were, uh, was indicated. And the guidelines that followed suggested that. Quick, however, there was a reevaluation of this study looking at something very interesting, and that's urine volume and result renal function. And the conclusion from the reanalysis is basically this. That was that peritoneal clearance and renal clearance were the same. Since peritoneal clearance will remain the same over time, but endogenous renal function does not. And this study suggested that for every uh, increase in five liters uh, per week per uh, surface area GFR, the malady risk decreased. And they also focused on, uh, after all ultrafiltration was accounted for, uh, if you're up over this value, then you, you would have a 30% risk of um, decreased death rate. So given that, importance of residual renal function coming out of the CANUSA study actually looking at targets for survival, uh, underlined, highlighted, and uh, began the emphasis of, of the importance of endogenous renal function and the survival and success of peritoneal dialysis. Uh, next decade, we will see articles talking about many things to protect the peritoneal, I mean, protect uh, endogenous renal function and uh, methods. So that uh, is an important um, event that occurred. The ACE study also was looking at um, outcome and looking at KT over uh, V urea, and basically, uh, and, and, and I will show that the um, article is from here if you want to uh, review it, uh, Jason, uh, in 2002. Uh, in study, we had one group that did their usual analysis and another group that extra dialysis added with question, um, will we prove survival if in fact we provide more and more dialysis? The answer was no. They were the same. Um, so survival rate at two years was about 68 and 69% for both groups. The Hong Kong group, 
looked at CAPD patients, but they looked at three areas for KT over V. 1.5 to 1.7, 1.7 to 2, and greater than 2. What they found is that patients that continued to drift under 1.7 area had more hospitalizations, more uh, requirements for support, and often developed uh, increased uh, symptoms of uremia, uh, suggesting that perhaps um, a target greater than 1.7 was indicated. Well, in 2006, all of these studies uh, then came into the new guideline as listed here. For patients undergoing peritoneal dialysis, the minimum, I'll emphasize this word, minimum, delivered dose for all solid clearance should be a total of AT over V of at least 1.7 per week. If you're renal, then you're obligated to monitor renal uh, over uh, the real contribution over time because this may well deteriorate over time and you'll need to adjust your dialysis to continue to prevent that. Uh, it should be uh, measured within the first month and then at least um, every four months after was the uh, recommendation. So we have a minimum target and we have some guidelines that are put in place. I already reviewed with you then, uh, now brought our urea kinetics and about it to peritoneal dialysis. We've re-looked at access placement and brought that up to date. Uh, we've talked about the importance of endogenous kidney function. Talked about uh, the knowledge of PET testing, how, how that might alter patient choice or help guide patient choice if you so choose to use that. We've talked about adjustment of prescription. Uh, we can do that in a proactive fashion. Uh, we can also uh, focus on preserving uh, peritoneal function by uh, using less uh, osmolar substance and then certainly using volume wisely to maintain your clearances. So all of that has occurred from A4 up until now. So you're looking at about two and a half decades of work to bring this up today. Where are we currently? We hear it nailed analysis. We know that our survival has improved. The tape failure has been reduced. When I talk about infection, the difference between 1 and 24 months and 1 and 40 months is survival and uh, acceptability. So just that alone has made a tremendous improvement. Um, the question is, um, has peritoneal dialysis itself become an acceptable modality? And the answer is yes. But what about the differences in modality? What is CAPD versus CCPD or automated PD? Are there any differences that would lead us to say one is better than the other? And if so, on the basis of what? What I would present to you is that there have been many papers, all of which have been limited based on numbers, duration, uh, varied conclusions, some favoring, some opposing. Uh, the studies have been observational, retrospective, and typically not conclusive, as there's been no head-to-head -head randomized controlled trial compare both of these modalities long-term. So basically, we're left to wonder about any difference. The thing that has taken place is this. Uh, this is some information kindly supplied to me by Dr. Guess from Baxter on a trend studies that I referenced took place on CAPD. CAPD really was peritoneal dialysis from 96 up until 200, uh, 2000 and uh, whatever, 2003. But this shows you that something has happened where more and more people are ending up on CCPD or APD. This is CAPD. Total number of patients from 0408 1,000 CAD, 27,000 had elected CCPD. So is it that the technology for the equipment and supplies have gotten better? Is it uh, in, uh, unit choice? Uh, I don't know what's driving that, but that change has occurred. And as we go forward, we simply ask a question, okay, this time we were all uh, looking at CAPD, and now we've switched 
more patients to CCPD compared to CAPD, would it not be fair to say that all the improvements that we're looking at represent the of using CCPD over CAPD? That this study, I highly recommend that you read. It was in Kidney International, volume 76, 97107, um, 2009. The title The Outcomes of Continuous Ambulatory and Updated Peritoneal Dialysis are similar. And they actually uh, focused on looking at the despairing relationship between the increased number of patients going on um, APD or CCPD versus CAPD. And they up that there was little or no difference in the risk of death or technique failure. More detail to this study shows that the outcomes of continuous ambulatory and automated peritoneal dialysis are similar. They use US RDS data. And 1996 was starting the review. And every two years from that point on, it was noted that several of patients' technique survival improved continuously over each period looked at, to the point that when they finished, there was a progression, a progressive reduction in the risk of death and technique failure for peritoneal dialysis patients. Patients with either CAPD or CCPD had the same outcome. The and peritoneal dialysis could not be attributed to increased use of CPD when they corrected uh, statistically for the factors involved. Peritoneal the out outcome was felt to be due to, to certainly the de decrease in infection rate that has occurred with our better knowledge. Assigned patients maybe could have been a factor, but clearly their prescription management and decreasing complications have led to this improvement. So as we come to the conclusion and ask Ending, but what are pros and cons? I submit to you that the cons were the first early years that we went through. We ran the treatment modalities from the 60s up to the 80s, and then for the next two decades, it has taken that length of time to develop the understanding of what constitutes adequate dialysis, how to control complications and infections. And to that end, the good is. That progress has been made. And as a result, we have two, not one, two excellent options on the guise of peritoneal dialysis that we can use. It provides the most flexible, most comprehensive option for patients that we can provide, uh, be in the hospital or at home. A choice then for home is enhanced. You train on both. They can choose which one they wish to do, and the good news is the outcomes are going to be not only just improved, but similar. So we have good options. I think if we stop and look at what's going on in the hemodialysis era, during the same period of time, we went to rapid dialysis, and now the thought is maybe we should slow this thing down. Maybe we should make it longer. Maybe we should look at nocturnal. Maybe we should look at daily home hemo. Interesting parallel from where we were to where we are now. And I'd like to stop, and then we can open it up for questions. Thank you. At the time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. We'll pause just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. And we are pausing. We do have a typed-in question here. Important Malden would like to know, what is your preference regarding training for CCPD versus CAPD in the initial training period? So that patients should train CAPD and then retrain one month or so later for CCPD? Okay, very interesting question. Our, our, I'll answer the question historically and currently. Uh, historically, we trained both because I think um, to make the treatment the flexible option that we saw it many decades ago, uh, that seemed like the prudent course. Too. You never know when you have issues beyond your control, um, hurricanes, movement, whatever, power outages. So it's always best to be able to do both. 
in talking with Dr. Guest, he shared with me, Dr. Guest at Baxter, shared with me an interesting point that patients that are initially trained on uh, uh, CAPD uh, first and then any day switch over to CCPD seem to have a better outcome. Now, what it is, I don't know. He doesn't know, but it is an observation. Whether it's an observation that has meaning, uh, at this point, I just pass it on as does it mean that patients are undergoing CAPD take more ownership, understand more about volume and, and uh, other issues? I don't know. I would certainly use both in the training period, and I would certainly make sure they're both known uh, to the patient's acumen and then they pick and choose. And then, uh, as such, then it's incumbent to update their expertise uh, in, in the event that they might need the other option later. I'd like to ask you a question over the phone line. Please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. We have no questions at this time. We have a write-in question. This is from Jesse Keen. A amount of PD is dextrose solution, which contributes to eventual membrane failure. Any development on alternatives? Why can't lower concentration of icodextrin work? Well, uh, another uh, good question. Uh, membrane failure um, uh, might occur uh, with the high glucose concentration. Uh, looking at ultrafiltration options and alternatives, uh, nothing has come forth. So to my knowledge, uh, I'm not sure that there are any other options um, to answer your question. Uh, again, uh, overexposure uh, is currently limited by the fact that we are monitoring accuracy targets fairly well. So if we follow the guidelines, hopefully some of the earlier problems with membrane failure can be cut back. Uh, but in terms of ultrafiltration, I'm not sure that um, I have the evidence that um, icodextran or others might um, be helpful in that regard. I certainly could ask Dr. Moran if he had a comment on that, but to my knowledge, no. Dr. Tucker, I, I would agree. I think individually it would say that use of icodextrin with low glucose concentrations would extend the life to the peritoneal membrane, but I don't think we have the evidence to support that. That would be summary. We currently have no questions over the phone line. I have a question from Alexandra Martinez. If you're on the line, would you like to answer your question or ask your question? You are one on your telephone keypad to queue up for your question. I think today, Matthew. You have no one in queue. If there are no other yeah. questions, I'd like to go ahead and thank. Uh, Dr. Tucker for hosting our, our series for us today. I just take a moment to thank everyone again also for participating and for time away from everyone's busy schedule to be with us here today so that we can learn how to better care for our patients. Be sure to join us for the next webinar that is scheduled for Friday, December 2nd, 11 a.m. Pacific time, 2 p.m. Eastern time. Dr. Rajnish Marotra will discuss the quality parameters and and tips on keeping patients on the therapy from the period of 90 days to six months. So those of Eatons that are out there worried about keeping patients on for their DQIs, this is the one that you certainly would like to attend. Thank you everyone again for attending, and have a good day. Today's conference call now disconnect. Presenters.